Here are some more applications of redox. We'll start with some unwanted redox chemistry known as corrosion. I'm sure you know that iron will rust if left outside. Iron will rust more quickly in humid climates than in dry climates. The reason is that water has a role as a conduit to move the ions and help this redox reaction happen. Oxygen is soluble in water, so wherever you have water, you have dissolved oxygen, at least on this planet. Here is the reduction half reaction for oxygen reacting with four electrons to make water, and it does so best in an acidic environment where there are H1 plus ions available to balance the reaction. This serves as the cathode with a plus 1.23 volt reduction potential. Iron is a good reducing agent and can be converted to iron 2 plus. For this example, we're using four electrons so that it balances with the oxygen redox reaction. Iron is an excellent anode with a reduction potential of minus 0.44 volts. So you notice if you take cathode, which is plus 1.23, minus anode, which is a minus minus 0.44 volts, you get plus 1.67 volts. So that would be a spontaneous redox reaction. And what happens is iron 2 plus can be soluble in water. So some of the iron is eaten away into ion that is soluble in the water. But we're not finished yet. Iron 2 plus is also a reducing agent. It can be converted to iron 3 plus. And the reduction potential for this is plus 0.77 volts. So you notice if you take cathode minus anode, you still have a positive voltage. So this spontaneous reaction occurs as well. It's a two-part reaction. The net redox reaction is that four moles of iron reacts with three moles of oxygen to make iron three oxide, which is that orange flaky material that you see on rusted iron which has no strength to hold anything upright. This is why many outdoor things like lawn chairs and umbrellas are made of aluminium. The same redox reaction does happen. Perhaps you've seen old aluminium that's been outside for a while and it kind of has a bit of a white crusty material on it. Redox has been happening. This time, I'm going to use three times the reduction reaction. It's the same one as before, where we have oxygen making water in the presence of acid, which serves as a great cathode at plus 1.23 volts. Aluminium is an excellent anode. We're going to use four moles of this reaction so we can balance out the electrons. Our reduction potential for that reaction is minus 1.66 volts. So you can see if we take cathode minus anode, we will wind up with a positive voltage change, which means a spontaneous reaction. This is the net reaction that occurs. Four moles of aluminum and three moles of oxygen, making two moles of aluminum oxide. The difference is that the aluminum oxide is made in one reaction, not a two-stage reaction. So it forms a protective layer on the outside of the aluminum to prevent future oxidation deeper into the bar of aluminum. This is known as passivation, protection of a reactive metal by the formation of an oxide layer. So aluminum passivates itself, whereas iron does not. Here's another example of passivation. I'm sure you know that copper in its elemental state has this orange color, like you would see on a penny. But the Statue of Liberty is made of copper, yet she appears green. This is because she has a passivating coating or patina of copper to carbonate. You may be asking, how does that form? Where did that carbonate come from? Well, if you're outside, you have water and carbon dioxide. These make carbonic acid. Carbonic acid in water 
can deprotonate to make bicarbonate, and it can deprotonate again to make carbonate. So we can oxidize the copper to copper 2 plus with oxygen or some other oxidant out in the atmosphere. And once we form the copper 2 plus, it combines with our carbonate to make this beautiful green color. Now, how do you stop iron from rusting? Well, you can't. It is a spontaneous redox reaction. If you have iron and oxygen available, electrons will always fall downhill. We will make iron 3 plus and oxide. So we can't stop it from happening, but we can offer oxygen something better to react with. We can coat iron with zinc. Zinc is more reactive than iron. So if we have a zinc coating on the outside of our iron, the zinc will react with the oxygen to make zinc 2 plus and oxide, and this will form a passivating layer. This process is called galvanization, protecting one metal by sacrificing another more reactive metal. Perhaps you've heard of galvanized steel. This is steel coated with zinc so that when oxidation occurs, we form a nice zinc oxide layer that doesn't disturb the integrity of the iron. Maybe you've heard of chrome plating. Same thing. So our more reactive zinc is galvanized onto the iron. So instead of the process of iron rusting, we get zinc turning into zinc oxide. That zinc oxide is the coating that protects the iron. Here's a little video to show you how this looks. When zinc metal is exposed to oxygen at high temperature, it reacts to form zinc oxide. Electrons are transferred from zinc to oxygen, creating oxide and zinc ions. We say that zinc has been oxidized. The oxidation of zinc by molecular oxygen is an example of an oxidation reduction reaction. More generally, oxidation corresponds to a loss of electrons. Zinc is oxidized because it loses electrons to the oxygen. On the other hand, oxygen is said to be reduced because it gains electrons. I hope you also noticed how things change size. Neutral zinc became smaller when it became zinc 2+. And the oxygen that came in became larger when the oxygen atoms became oxide or anions. Here is why you should be careful if you're buying gold overseas at a market. It's very easy to sell tin as a very inexpensive metal with a gold coating. Here are the reduction potentials for tin 2 plus going to tin. This is at minus 0.31 volts. And gold can either be 1 plus or 3 plus. I'll show you the 1 plus reaction. Gold 1 plus is a very good oxidizing agent with a reduction potential of plus 1.68 volts. So you can see that electrons will fall downhill from tin to gold 1 plus. Tin is our anode, and gold 1 plus is our cathode. So if we turn around the top reaction and add them in such a way that the electrons cancel, we wind up with this net reaction. We'll be converting some of our tin to tin 2 plus and some of our gold 1 into gold so that we have a thin coating of gold on top of our inexpensive tin. You can find gold plating kits on the internet. Typically, you do have to use some electricity in this to get a nice, even coating and to overcome the energy of activation. This is a bit dangerous, though, because to get the gold soluble, often they use the cyanide ion. Perhaps you realize cyanide is not that healthy for you. The next application of redox involves electrolysis. This is forcing a non-spontaneous reaction to take place by the application of voltage. Electrolysis can be used to produce chemicals. One common electrolysis reaction involves taking calcium chloride, which is molten, and running electricity through that molten solution to make calcium and chlorine. 
Now, many students look at this at this point and say, well, the electrons belonging to the calcium spontaneously fall downhill to the chlorine. But we're doing electrolysis and a non-spontaneous reaction. So we're going to force the electrons belonging to chloride to jump uphill to calcium 2+. This means we are reversing our anode and our cathode assignments. Though you learned this mnemonic for galvanic cells, I like big red cats. That told you to put reduction, the cathode, and the positive charge, or positive reduction potential, together. Electrolysis is the second part of this statement, but red cats hate me. In electrolysis, reduction still occurs at the cathode, but it belongs to the more negative reduction potential. So in this reaction, the negative 2.87 is our cathode, so we leave the top reaction written as is, as a reduction. And the bottom reaction is our anode, and this one we have to flip around for our oxidation. So when we're finished, the net reaction is that calcium ions react with chloride ions to make calcium metal and chlorine gas. Chlorine gas is used in a lot of industrial processes. Another example of electrolysis is extracting metal from their ores. You don't find an aluminum mine. Aluminium exists in the Earth's crust as an oxide, aluminium oxide. So the only way to get aluminium metal is to do a redox reaction of the aluminium oxide with carbon, and the gas that comes out is carbon dioxide. This is known as the hall herol process. Why else might you be interested in electrolysis? Well, eventually our fossil fuels are going to become depleted. So what can we do? What can we use to power our vehicles? It's been suggested that hydrogen gas would be an excellent choice because the product of hydrogen and oxygen is water. We already have lots of water in our atmosphere, so that's not a problem. There are many scientists looking at where the hydrogen will come from. It can come from electrolysis of water, methane, or ammonia. We have to wonder, in our future, will there be fuel stations in which wind and solar-powered electrolytic cells hydrolyze water to hydrogen and oxygen? I'm willing to bet yes. So how do we get the hydrogen out of the water? Once again, we're going to do electrolysis. So these are the reduction reactions that are involved in water. This time, I'm going to use the reduction potentials for neutral water. For step two, you notice once again, we're going to assume that the orbitals on the left are empty, and the orbitals on the right have electrons. I know I should have four electrons there, but this is strictly for purposes of demonstration. So when we assign our anode and our cathode, remember that for electrolysis, red cats do not like you. We're going to be forcing the electrons uphill from a lower level to a higher level empty orbital. So the reduction is going to be our negative 0.41 volt reaction. So I'm going to write my reduction reaction as is. My oxidation or anode is going to be the lower reaction. So you notice how I have taken the lower reaction of plus 0.88 volts, and I've placed the water on the reactant side, and the rest of the reactants on the product side, turned it around, flipped it. Now, of course, I need to multiply the top reaction by 2 in order to get my electrons in to equal my electrons out. Now I can add this together, and it looks like a complicated reaction, but let me simplify it for you. Here is the same reaction. I hope you know from previous chemistry, or I hope you will know soon from the acid-base chapter that when we have hydroxide and hydrogen ion, they meet to make water. So if I have six waters on this side and four waters on the product side, I can cancel that out. Here is our simplified net reaction. When you run electricity through water, you will get two moles of hydrogen, and one mole of oxygen. 
If we want to get the voltage required to do this, remember that we typically take cathode minus anode, reduction occurs at the cathode, oxidation happens at the anode. Unfortunately, our red cats hate us, so the more negative potential is our cathode, the more positive is our anode, so we wind up with a negative voltage for our non-spontaneous reaction. So it will cost us at least 1.29 volts and probably a little bit more due to energy of activation to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Here is a schematic of how this can be done. It gets a little bit confusing because, of course, from the battery's perspective, the anode is where electrons leave and the cathode is where electrons arrive. But from the water's perspective, where the electrons arrive is where reduction occurs. So that would be our cathode at minus 0.41 volts with neutral water. And where electrons leave and oxidation occurs would be our anode from the water's perspective at plus 0.88 volts. Okay, let us visit a younger version of myself doing electrolysis. Electrolysis is an example where we take a non-spontaneous reaction and we force it forward toward the product using an energy source. In this case, our energy source is going to be a battery. So I will take this battery and hook it up to these electrodes, which are attached to platinum metal. The platinum metal is in a solution of water. So let's see what kind of reaction can be forced in water if we supply a power source like electricity. And as you can see, bubbles are starting to form. The reaction appears to be more vigorous on the left side with the black cathode than it does on the right side with the red anode. At the completion of the reaction, notice how there is twice the volume of gas on the left burette as there is on the right burette. In the left burette, we have made hydrogen gas, and in the right burette, we have made oxygen gas. The stoichiometry of the reaction is 2 moles to 1 mole. This is a non-spontaneous reaction, so as long as the battery is hooked up, the gases continue to be produced. But notice, as soon as we unhook the power supply, our reaction stops because it's non-spontaneous and needs energy to continue. So I hope that demonstrated for you how electrolysis is non-spontaneous and showed you the stoichiometry presented in the reaction really shows up in the burettes. So here's a question for you. Pick the metals that tin could be galvanized with. In order to answer this question, we're going to need to look at the chart. Here is where tin is on our reduction chart. You notice that aluminum and magnesium are higher up the chart, and lead and copper are lower on the chart. So what do you need to galvanize a metal? Something that is less reactive as a reducing agent? or more reactive as a reducing agent. Here is another question for you. Which type of cell is appropriate for the redox reaction below? There's a couple ways you can answer this, but I think the pictorial method is honestly the easiest. For me, I think it's easiest to find the redox reactions from the chart and list them more negative on top and more positive on the bottom. Then let's go through our steps where the oxidizing agents have empty orbitals and the reducing agents have electrons in their orbitals. Step three is circle what you have. 
Now, I know at this point most students say, but I have everything. No, no, no. Circle what you have reacting. I have chloride on the reactant side and sodium on the reactant side. So what do those electrons need to do to get from chloride to sodium? Do they go uphill or downhill? That will help you answer this question. Let's try the same approach with this question. Once again, I have the redox reactions. I'm going to circle what I have reacting, which is sodium reacting with tin 2 plus. So what do the electrons need to do when they go from sodium to tin 2 plus? Go uphill or go downhill? There's another way that some students like to solve this. They'd like to solve for E cell is equal to E reduction minus E oxidation. They look at this and say, well, the tin has been reduced. So I'm going to put minus 0.14 here. Then they look at the sodium and say, well, that has been oxidized. So they use a minus minus 0.271, which is a plus 0.271. They add those together, and of course, if you get a positive voltage, you're talking about a galvanic cell, and a negative voltage, that would be an electrolytic cell. So choose which way works best for you.